as, as Master Burbeck to welcome you um, to this fourth in the series of our lectures celebrating the 100 years of Birkbeck joining the University of London in 1920. And of course, lots of anniversaries get celebrated for all sorts of reasons, but this one is actually a very important one because by this, still today, our students part-time studying in the evening know that the qualification they are getting is a qualification of the University of London, is a qualification that parallels the qualifications gained by daytime students at all the other prestigious colleges of the university. So it is a very important thing for us and something which we really need to celebrate. It was not an easy task to get Birkbeck into the University of London. George Armitage Smith, who was the principal from 1896 onwards, fought this fight tremendously um, with opposition from other colleges, with Kings, for example, saying that Birkbeck should teach preparatory classes to those who were not yet prepared for university. And then these students suitably prepared could go on to Kings. Ironically, Armitage Smith demonstrated that Kings had more pre-university courses compared to university level courses than did Birkbeck, and that sort of fought the argument. And indeed, since I started giving these introductions, having read a bit more, I discovered a quote in which it was said that Armitage Smith was opposed by many of his governors, who said that all Birkbeck needed to do was to be the same literary institute and to expand and take more students, but not worry about the University of London. He overcame all these and he succeeded in Birkbeck being admitted to the University of London. And interestingly, one of the other things he did was to reorganize Birkbeck into five faculties, which interestingly is equivalent to the five schools we have today. And so therefore it's entirely appropriate that we have the five lectures chosen by each one by each school. And tonight we come to the School of Arts. I do not think there could be anybody um, more appropriate to give this than Marina Warner, someone who of course has a tremendously distinguished career, but who also left the University of Essex because of its commercialization and came and found, I think, a welcome home with us in Birkbeck. And Marina, you might be interested to know that one of George Armitage Smith's five faculties was called English and Commercial. So a rather <laughs> strange association which perhaps we might not um, maintain today. But I don't need to tell you of the distinction of Marina Warner. There cannot be many people who have received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the British Academy combined with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the World Fantasy Awards. Um, <laughs> there cannot be many people, indeed any people, who have been and are president of the Royal Society of Literature but have also inspired a Dire Straits song. And so it's my great pleasure on all these grounds, not least the song, to invite Marina Warner to deliver the 200th anniversary lecture. relatives, pilgrimage and procession, theme parks and reenactments, 
phrase making and play. Can story making convey through the charting of place, weave relations between people and their places, and breathe meaning into the unknown shore, the unfamiliar landing stage, the stranger country? In the resonant phrase of the geographer Marcus Dole, can an existence that has been hollowed out become re-enchanted, hallowed by acts of imagination in relation to the place where one finds oneself? In the 30s, the philosopher Alfred Korzybski coined the now famous axiom, the map is not the territory. He was writing in the context of neurolinguistics and he meant that we don't know a place according to the principles of a map, but through daily experiences of it, which form our cognitive orientation. The geographical chart, or ordnance survey, doesn't encompass the distinctive qualities of a place for individuals and communities who inhabit and negotiate it any more than the quantification of a waterfall conveys the feeling of approaching it through a wood or standing under it. Territory is home the neighborhood, the quartier, the hood. Besides this empirical first-hand understanding, territory is also a shimmering place of the imagination and of memories made by mental imagining, individually and socially in relation to one another. Does it follow that the meaning of a territory can be transformed, transfused with new history and stories by people who arrive and take up occupation of it? Can mapping and modeling territory become a way of inhabiting and feeling at home? If so, can this process be undertaken consciously as well as unconsciously? Also, can this act of putting oneself on the map not constitute a threat to existing customs and traditions? Is there a way of staking a claim to a place through naming and story making that doesn't replicate the methods of the colonizers? The current hostilities to the new arrivals, to migrants, exiles, refugees, asylum seekers, often arise from a sense that the local habitat has been altered, while those who have arrived may also be made to feel like aliens. At the end, I'll turn to a very small example of such a strategy in action through the project called Stories in Transit and the workshop Giocarella in Palermo, Sicily and consequently propose possible extensions of such strategies among groups and individuals who have arrived in Europe in the last decade, but not only. The excellent mayor of Palermo, Leo Luca Orlando, faced with thousands of Arabs, mostly from Africa, has been shaping a culture of openness based on a fluid and multi-stranded civic sense of being a Palermitano, a lot on, on, a long, on a long-standing history as of Palermo and Sicily as a crossroads of the Mediterranean. Reflecting on the role of storytelling in communities of displaced people, I'll then look at some strategic uses of imagination to mark territory on maps that tell the stories of people, not only of land and sea, towns and villages. I'm not excluding literature, as writing stories is still the prime way of diffusing them, but I shall focus on acts of conceptualizing place through various actions and media. Mapping, broadly speaking, falls into two contrasting modes, historical and imaginary. Acts of historical record keeping in the form of memorials, street names, blue plaques, landmark, blue plaques, landmarks, the names of airports, even of whole cities, guided tours and landmark sites, sorry, and sites, which, which claim to identify a place with an individual or an act. Naming and renaming are crucial processes of historical memory. Reviving the stories that belong to a place and have been muted bears witness to the contours and coordinates that a current hegemony cancels out. This is Simon Patterson's, I'll come back to it, very famous um, map of the renaming the entire um, underground map system. You can see some of the names. We've got Gina Long and Bridget as a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, lines are, the lines follow artists or philosophers, you can probably see for yourselves, and saints and so forth, the different lines have been given different themes. The poet Elizabeth Bishop wrote, topography displays no favorites, norths as near as west. More delicate than the historians are the map makers' colors. The lovely music of these lines 
and their place within the urn of a poet who often cried out against colonizing damage, expresses a common faith in the reliability of cartography and its independence of vested interests. Somehow the procedures of geographers do not then seem so blatantly ideological as the written narratives of history. Their discipline used to be perceived as progressive and exact, led by the improvements of instruments and governed by accurate measurement, whereas history was always understood to be a story that could be told differently by the victorious and the defeated, by the indigenous inhabitant and the colonial settler. Yet such a view of topography looks and feels very different today, since Bishop was writing, when its role in the building of empires has been recognized. Maps and their map makers and map, and maps and their makers were essential catalysts to the great powers, wealth, and competition for land and mastery of the seas, conquests of new worlds, acquisition of resources, and establishment of networks and tra of trade influence, and the drawing up of national borders. All those actions are, of course, driving a lot of the flight and the refugee system all over the world. <coughs> the fight for resources, the drug map of the new lines. The Rohingya have been displaced from Myanmar. And as a result, there are now hundreds of Bengali refugees in Europe, including in Sicily. Um, the very term ordnance survey used for the official maps of Britain and its colonies raises doubt about geography's freedom from Western interests, as those pioneering detailed government maps were originally commissioned to record the presence of military plant <coughs> known as ordnance, that is weapons, ammunition, and so forth. Map making looks very much less delicate now, and nowhere more so than in the eastern Mediterranean, where successive political and military arrangements have inscribed new maps on the region, from the Sykes Pico Agreement of 1916, and more recently, the walls and settlements that the regime in Israel has built in Palestine. Aerial photographs taken by Fazal Sheikh in the Negev Desert reveal imprinted on the rocks and in the sand the ghostly outlines of Bedouin encampments, <coughs> cemeteries, and other constructions. Abud's archaeological and subjective mappings express a personal aesthetic approach to the same processes. Nothing is more crucial to survival <coughs> than access to water. Nothing gives greater power than controlling its distribution and its quality. But historical projections <coughs> Even dreams, even dreams, also inform maps. Paramount examples would be the site of Troy, subject of a marvelous exhibition at the British Museum, um, which you see the, com the competition for mapping the real Troy in many different ways in different places. And the scenes of Jesus' sufferings and death and resurrection in Jerusalem, the temple and the Via Crucis, the way of the cross, that he took to Calvary and is followed by thousands of pilgrims every year. These most sacred sites are presented as if they are matters of historical record, that they are, at best, conjectures. The temporality is jumbled, the evidence established by tradition and highly contested. Tradition and hope have turned them into history. In the large family of imaginary maps, the most ancient, and in some ways the most overlooked, or that is normalized, examples represent the constellations as narratives. The connections drawn between the stars are filled with myths of gods and heroes, animals and monsters. These are ancient dream maps, and, and we don't question them at all. Though the proximity of one star to another is an illusion of parallax from our vantage point on Earth, and the constellations themselves are arbitrary impositions of pattern on random scatterings. There are also straightforward maps of imaginary places, as you know. The delicately drawn charts of Lilliput and Laputa and all the other places in Gulliver's Travels, the Shah in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and the rest of them in Mordor and the whole landscape of Lord of the Rings, also mapped, mapped very carefully by Tolkien, and many, many others you will be able to think of for yourselves. Their simplest, most daily form turns up in children's playground games when a tree or a dustbin can become a safe haven, and a chalk diagram on the ground marks the hopscotch path from earth to heaven. <coughs> Such imaginary maps are often drawn up by extrapolating from a landscape or town or village, which a writer or other artist, a composer or painter, loved and inhabited, and recast in their work 
transfiguring those places for better or worse, according to the precepts of fiction and the workings of their own <coughs> mind and memory. Lady Murakami's Kyoto in the Tale of Genji, Proust's Combré and Red Balek, Thomas Hardy's Wessex. What has been remarked on, a bit less, however, is the way an imaginary landscape or townscape maps back onto real neighborhoods, how Verona has become the place where Romeo and Juliet lived and loved, and, and their families feuded, how Harley's topography has returned and reconfigured Dorset and its environments. And its environments. Original places have sometimes even been renamed after their fictional metamorphoses. So Ilie, which was Proust's um, original hometown, is now called Combré, after what it was named in the book. Um, some, feels this, some feel this is the product of a banal theme park mentality, <coughs> fake news for the tourist trade. But I'm not so leery of it. Places are changed by the writings about them, and these infusions of story enrich their <coughs> meaningfulness and often actually heighten their interest. The place comes to life through this imaginative construct. Frequently, an imaginary site will take such hold of people's minds that they transpose it somewhere else and reproduce it, often in multiple locations. Among imaginary mapping are acts of translation of one place to another, Theme parks, again, which are popular on many continents, reenact stories of every kind, drawing on all four of these approaches to map making. The untold and hidden histories, the palimpsest, the imaginative projection, and the reenactment. One total immersive environment, simulating another elsewhere. Ludwig of Bavaria's obsessively recreated German legend of Siegfried and Al, et al., and et cetera, in his pleasure gardens and palaces, uh, try to reproduce wonders far away, such as Capri's Blue Grotto. His, follows, his follies were pioneering acts, translating into a secular space, a pleasure space in his palaces, sacred myths as ritually repeated and enacted in temples and churches. But Ludwig wasn't altogether de the territory. These stories were in many ways holy to him. His scene setting depended on a linked chain of images, his Siegfried idols, transmitted through Wagner, in turn the Wagnerian motifs generated a few <coughs> more traveling dreams. His fairy tale castle was copied by Walt Disney for the first of the signature centerpieces of his theme parks and projected into fairy tale, Cinderella of uh, the Ring Cycle. This steepling castle, rising in a dreary, flat, dust bowl, hard scrabble, hard scrabble suburb of Los Angeles, has podded many more fantasy castles across the world, reaching as far as China and Japan. And the new, uh, there's a new one going up in Shanghai now. These realizations of territory, according to mental mappings, have a tendency to fold back on reality and change it in their own image, until the locals, as well as travelers or literary pilgrims, revel in those places in the light of the narratives that have been made up and fed the phenomenon. Prince Edward Island in Canada where the writer Lucy Maud Montgomery was born and lived and set her beloved novel Anne of Green Gables, unfolds in a theme park in situ, sights and scenes from the book. In Hokkaido in Japan, a duplicate of this Canadian habitat has been created, so the Japanese fans of the book, of whom there are astonishingly many, need not travel so far to enter its embodied places and can even get married in a replica of the parlor when Montgomery and herself was married. So now I'm going to return to each of these map-making modes in more detail. First, acts of historical record-keeping in situ. Maps may seek to record what actually took place there in that location in the past and bring it back to consciousness. These historical events need both the scholars' researches, archaeological digs, property records, local newspapers, on this basis, places come to life, filled with characters through imaginative speculation and dramatic reconstruction. The results are often profoundly affecting. The Martyrs Memorial in Oxford remembers Latimer, Ridley, and Cramner, who were burned alive in 1555-1556 under Queen Mary. There's a fine Gothic cross um, with their statues, but the far more powerful sight, to my mind, is the crudely exposed square of cobbles in the middle of Broad Street, 
which is the very spot, we are told, marked on the map, where their power was built and their deaths took place. This precision is not altogether likely, but the mark, as it is called, sends a frisson of genuine terror at the intolerance and cruelty that happened. Seeing the place stirs the mind's associative powers. The phantasmata of fresh images arise. And such acts of marking the map, distinguishing places with history through naming monuments and memorials, share underlying principles. Since the 18th century and the felt need for verification by forensic and objective methods, a strong tendency has developed to lean on empirically verifiable data. In mapping, the precision and detail of the survey sets a gold standard, and with the computer projections now, much more information can be amassed, and different projections have, of course, been devised. However, there was a tradition of bringing people into the picture that maps draw. In the United States, in the early decades after independence, the teacher called Eva Willard resolved to find a way of including time in her maps and in chronicling history. She populated the marvelously innovatory charts she created. She wanted to imbue her pupils with a sense of geographical relations between society and environments. She was a pioneer of the timeline projected onto images of places. She was also a creative thinker, and her inventions show her humanity and her wit. For example, she made a straightforward account of the Native Americans in their territories. This, in the 1820s, was an extraordinary act of historical respect. She wrote of one of her famous images called the Temple of Time. So this picture, made on paper, through unlike duration, represents it by proportional space. It is as scientific and intelligible to represent time by space as to represent space by space. The scholar, Susan Shorten, reviewing Willard's work on a brilliant online journal platform, which I recommend to you, called Public Domain, comments, a map, in other words, is an arrangement of symbols into a system of meaning. And we use maps because we understand the language of science that undergirds them. If the mapping of space was a human invention, Willard explained, one could, one could also invent a means of mapping time. Willard also devised ingenious mnemonics. In 1824, her first published textbook, she offered a remarkable map showing the course of the Amazon River and its many tributaries, and then uses this complex rhizome to chart the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. You can see how this startling overlay of utterly disparate bodies of data would trigger the synapses of people in class, who's a teacher, a classroom teacher. By reimagining the potential of map making, Willard reveals how she understood the medium's narrative qualities and bound up with those its intrinsic partiality, even tendentiousness. The coolest rational approach to measuring and surveying carries ideological baggage. In his acclaimed play, Translations, written in 1980 and recently revived at the National Theatre, here. The Irish playwright Brian Free revisited the Ordnance Survey of Ireland, which was drawn up by the British in the 19th century. Through the character of a young soldier, he dramatizes how the ma mapping marched in step to the colonization of the country, as the Gaelic place names were crossed out and replaced by English words, which in some cases were approximate renderings that were otherwise plucked out of the air. The place names that were being deleted were packed with associations history, lived experience, folklore, and provided on the ground itself the coordinates of memory, that idea that Willard has that maps are maps of time. Um, often they were replaced by names familiar to the new occupants, London, Derry, as you know, New York. As often in history, the principle has been well understood and put into practice by authorities wielding power. Mapping and colonialism have been intrinsically intertwined. The contemporary artist um, Leila Curtis, whose hometown is Newcastle, UK, yeah, extends this strategy in her alternative maps, for which she's created a layered palimpsest of the imperial reach of Britain historically, as places all over the world were also called Newcastle and Gateshead. Her overview of Tyneside looks familiar, um, but contains startling features, such as the large area labeled desert, just to the north of the northern English city, probably taken from Australia. Her superimpositions 
which retrieved land grabs in territories once settled by the British, and returning the gesture, act to decolonize the map. Hers and realigns the hierarchy of here and there, and brings there here. In Australia, Canada, Jamaica, and Ireland, Leila Curtis found 52 new castles, or new castles, two, two words, 15 Washingtons, and so forth. The only gate said is an island floating out in the North Sea. Beneath the original naming by the settlers in those peripheries of empire, there lay an impulse to bring the old home into the new one. Think of all those thousands of places from major metropoles, like New York and Boston, to states like New Hampshire, and to small towns and villages in the Midwest with the names of German and Middle European places left behind by the emigrants. This isn't theme park reenactment, though it shares motives and feelings, being rooted in a human desire to belong to the map. The acute sense of the world tilting when a familiar place is estranged through alien acts of naming can be felt by us, I think, who have not suffered it directly, perhaps, when we look at Soviet maps of London made in the 1980s. The information is hard, is un unparalleled in its accuracy, and apparently it objective. But the effect is disorientating and frightening, not just because the military motives that drove this impressively comprehensive cartographical achievement, but also because the um, measuring and surveying carry ideological, sorry, measuring the compass point switching, you can feel compass point switching as we look at London on these maps, but I couldn't recognize my own neighborhood. But this is actually Leighton, that for those of you who are going to be Russian. Um, the most recent issue of the journal PN Review, Poetry Nation Review, prints a very fine meditation on this theme by Kai Miller, who's a novelist and poet who was born in Jamaica and now teaches at Glasgow University. This long prose poem come essay is called Sometimes I Consider the Names of Places, and it's a fierce lament for the effaced stories of Jamaica and other islands in the Caribbean. Sometimes I consider the names of places, the West Indies, or said another way, Western India, as if India was not enough. And isn't it incredible that such a name should stick, despite all geographic proof to the contrary? And maybe this is what the place is, a distorted way of seeing, an insufficient imagining. Cristobal, this is Krambus, of course. Come si dice Taino in Espanol, India. Cristobal, come si dice Cari in Espanol, India. Cristobal, come si dice Guanajuato in Espanol, India. What did it matter, our own names? We are insufficiently imagined people from an insufficiently imagined place. So the precedents are grim, but do they rule out changing the methods to new dreams, to imagine more, to imagine less insufficiently? In translations, the, the, the Brown Friel play I mentioned before, the character Hugh, speaking to the English soldier carrying out the survey, comments, yes, Gaelic is a rich language, Lieutenant, full of the mythologies of fantasy and hope and self-deception, a syntax opulent with tomorrows. This sounds defensive. Hope is not always the same as self-deception. It could open the way to different tomorrows. Besides, hope is in itself a comfort telling stories with variations on the future has been a human resource since the first imaginative tales were told. I'm aware that, they, that fairy tales have been denounced for instilling false consciousness, but I stand with Walter Benjamin and Ernst Bloch and Angela Carter, who upheld the spirit of heroic optimism that fills these stories. That deficit that Kaimila pinpointed, that insufficient imagining, must be the focus of new story-making energy. In contemporary map making, histories remain the bedrock, with new seams opening up and yielding unsuspected riches. If I asked you at this anniversary lecture, <coughs> Berkeley, who was Berkeley? Perhaps not many of you would know. Or who was Mallet of Mallet Street? And does it matter? I think it does. If you think of na the name in London compared to Paris, London's named after the proprietors, the Grover Estate of Bedford Estates. Mallet Street is called after Sir Edward Mallet, who was married to the daughter of the ninth Duke of Bedford. Significant victories, Waterloo, Trafalgar, are embedded in the urban fabric. This wall, for example, remembers Charles Claw, the developer and philanthropist. 
Paris memorializes its share of battles and bloody triumphs in the battlefields and repeated uh, urban insurgencies, but it also inscribes into its grand plan and metro system a whole almanac of poets, <coughs> doctors, and mathematicians, and the street plaques help date and identify their callings and deeds, often obscure. The process itself involves erasures and additions. Marie Curie was added to the street in the Latin Quarter, first named after her husband, Pierre Curie, and he had overtaken someone else, whose name I'd forgotten, but I remember that when I was first in Paris in the 60s, the plaque said, formerly X Street. Hence, many double names of metro stations in the scientists coupled with the battle. Ville Juif, the old ghetto, is now hyphenated threefold, with leading lights of French communism before World War II. The poet and flaneur Louis Aragon, Léo Lagrange, and Paul Bayan Couturier, who is the author of a pacifist fairy tale called Bread, John Without Bread. These metro station names are mini palimpsests overlaying one person's story with another, or one event with another, in various combinations. And frequently, without Wikipedia, who would know most of these figures? These acts of remembrance people the map and turn it into territory saturated with ongoing historical estimations of certain individuals' significance. Unlike a waxwork storytelling, villains are on the whole deleted from the cartographic record. Last year, <coughs> we, all, all of us, a women's campaign fly-posted the city with 1,400 changes of street names. They were setting out to mark the lives of women both remarked and unremarked, exceptional and utterly overlooked, and made a special em emphasis on victims of murders by victims <coughs> of murder by lovers, husbands, and clients. So the um, so here you and often there, there, there are puns involved. So Rue des Rigaux, which sort of means the street of jokes, a pun there. So she's called Annie Jump Cannon, and she was an American astronomer. So I think there's a kind of so, so a certain spirit of mystery there. Um, the, um, so here and here is what here is the some of the women. So they they they, they use the word conjoint for partner, killed by her partner. The street anonymous, killed by her partner. So they did 1,400 of these um, all over Paris. Some of you probably saw them. They reminded me of the writing of Patrick Mogano, from the of France, who in a novel like Amour de l'Ordre and retraces the streets of occupied Paris in the footsteps of one of the many Jews who were living there and were hunted by the Vichy authorities so they could be deported. His protagonist <coughs> manages to evade them for a while. But Modiano loses all clues to her movements. He succeeds, however, in raising her ghost for us, as if she were before us once again. Likewise, at certain points in the city where a resistance fighter was shot, a plaque marks the spot on a bridge, a corner, in the middle of the street on the pavement. Again, these acts of reinscription populate the streets with, for passers-by with stories in situ that would otherwise have vanished under the resurfacing of the tarmac and the redecoration or even replacing of the buildings. There is even a term for this practice, which is called neo-toponymy. The inscribed map of the London Underground, drawn up by Simon Patterson, was an inspired um, and a memorable example of such historical resistance to history as it has been told. <coughs> Patterson called his map the Great Bear after the constellation, more commonly known as the Plough, Ursa Major, the star, in Ursa Major, the stars represent the myth of Callisto, the nymph whom Diana, the goddess, rejected when she became pregnant by Zeus. He took pity on her and placed her in the heavens with her son, his child, Arcturus, as the brightest star in the constellation. Catastrophism, the star legend, is the term for ancient Greek, in ancient Greek for this frequent consequence of the gods' crimes against people. They make amends by fixing them for eternity in the story in the sky. By alluding to this complex and wonderful chain of associations and to Star Map's mystic, mythic vision of causality, the artist of the alternative London underground map reminds us of the way maps make meanings out of fancy and desire. His map has been paid the compliment of widespread imitation. The women's subway map in New York also renames the stations, as you'll be able to see, I hope. 
um, comes with very, very um, tremendous mixture of names. The process of reawakened science history are, however, entangled with narrative imagination as well as inquiry into the facts, especially when the whole point is that time has disappeared for certain people and events. The American short story writer and novelist George Saunders is haunted by the slipperiness of the past. In his book, a prize-winning novel, Lincoln and the Bardo, he dramatizes an intermediate state of existence between dying in this world and acceding to the next. He's borrowed this threshold of state from Buddhist cosmology. The Bardo is a kind of limbo, a quantum time zone where a person is neither dead nor alive. His acute sensitivity to ambiguous and contradictory states matches his doubts about epistemic stability. In an interview with Zadie Smith, he remarked, while researching my novel, I came across two quirky, powerful books on Lincoln, both consummate labors of love. The physical Lincoln is a catalog of every description of every part of Lincoln's body ever recorded. The unpopular Mr. Lincoln lists all the many negative, hateful, and threatening things ever written about Lincoln. These had the effect of destabilizing my view of history, underscoring the notion that any history is just a selective sample and that reality is always eluding our attempts to reduce it. Saunders undertook to write fiction, as many writers do, precisely in order to make reality present, and his short stories wander through many threshold states between reality and unreality, the theme park being one of his recurrent scenarios, evoked with foolish furious comic bitterness. However, the ambition of imaginative literature to retrieve lost time in history leads me to another conjectural, less historically verifiable aspect of mapping territory. Story and history are the same word in many languages, and this reflects their interconnectedness. Plays, novels, epic poems, ballads, and other vessels of story give us a version of the past that is frequently rooted in intense archival and documentary research by the authors and has, vivid, has powers of vivid evocation that impinge their vision on the readers. How hard it is to shake off the villainous George Richard III or the Anne Boleyn of Hilary Mantel. Historical fiction often arises from the writer's immediate experience of events, such as the fascist years in Italy after Mussolini allied himself with the Nazis, which Natalia Ginsberg relates in her magnificent book, actually called La Storia, History or Story. Process is demanded by the novel form, dramatic characters, narrative momentum, structural patterning, bring imagination into play. And with imagination come invention, selection, and reconfiguring of the record. And that's not even to mention questions of subjectivity. Mapping likewise takes different directions from retrospective reactivation of memory and history. Mapping can be imaginative too. Places can be infused with meaning which doesn't arise organically from that location, it can be reimagined to acquire a story. We each relate to one another and to the places where we live according to our interests and occupations over time, as well as our bodies, and we need to choose stories about them and pass them on, relate them, keep them, keep our social and personal relations alive. George Mackay Brown has a luminous short story called Five Green Waves, which begins Time was lines and circles and squares. These are the tools of the geometer, the cartographer. But 20 pages on, after the child narrator, the I of the story, has been through adventures and misadventures, he writes, time was skulls and butterflies and guitars. The map of the young protagonist's <coughs> life has become furnished, planted, become his territory. Rebecca Solnit is a writer who worked on subway map. Um, is a writer of cultural criticism who has been engaged with feminist and environmental ideas since her earliest essays on the Nevada desert bordering her home state of California and the weapons testing and other chemical and military experiments in the region. Um, she um, has created a series of atlases. Um, the first is called Infinite City and charts her own San Francisco. The second explores New Orleans and most recently she's produced New York or non-stop city, city, city. At the beginning of her enterprise, she became interested in how a child, or a night worker, or a gay barista, or a lorry driver would know a place and live there, yet experience it entirely differently. Their territory might not appear on the map at all. 
She writes, as a citizen of this city for over 30 years, San Francisco, I'm constantly struck that no two people live in the same place. Your current surroundings exist in relation to your other places, your formative place, and whatever place shaped your ethnic heritage and education, and in relation to your role in this current place, where people look at you with suspicion, whether you're fearful or confident, whether lots of people or few look like you. A city is many worlds in the same place. She set out to find the many worlds in the city's parks and streets, exploring and gathering material until she could map it thematically. But and she has so the, this is one double, this is one complete city. This is the um, monarchs and queens. So she puts together butterflies and gay bars and gay, gay gay districts in San Francisco. Again, there's a kind of juxtaposition that's witty. Um, here she has the poison the palate. San Francisco is famous for its cuisine. It's also famous for its military poison activities with um, chemical weapons and so forth. So and then this one is in her book. Um, a New York book, and this is a remapping. This is very Emma Willard like, actually, in which she maps the Caribbean onto the archipelago of New York as a continuous because of the numbers of Caribbean people living um, between the two places. Um, these atlases are substantial works, the fruit of patient collaboration with friends and fellow residents interviewing neighbors and others and assembling their visions and memories. Her books are exhilarating volumes filled with beautiful colored hand-drawn maps that pick out clusters and concerns and paths of desire. I'm now going to look at the exuberant cartography of an, of an English artist, Adam Dant, who's also an intense observer of the urban scene and whose practice is profoundly engaged with mapping and storytelling in all their possible combinations. Dan approaches his art from several narrative angles, but one that has proved fruitful creates palimpsests, projections of one place on another, or more than one, until many timelines and many places become interwoven, intersheathed. He now rents for his studio, a place above the space above the synagogue in um, his own his local shortage, in itself a remarkable location saturated with the city's vicissitudes since at least medieval times. And his prolific work revisits this neighborhood and beyond through Hackney and more particularly Spitalfields and Clappenwell. And he exhibits a mordant, playful spirit of contestation and invention. Dan's researches with indefatigable curiosity and has unearthed a cornucopia of people and stories who team on his maps. His graphics also condense his histories and dreams. He has reimagined his area and others such as Mayfair and the City of London, Covent Garden, packed with crowded scenes of daily life, animated with endless invention. He has a Hogarthian gift of drawing characters in every situation, and he also shares that artist's blazing passion, sorrow, rage, and indignation at what goes on in our streets. He also travels far afield, always taking his bearings from unexpected and often marginalized signs of people's presence. He has charted London's lost rivers, here they are, and the various lost stories of guardian figures, of the, of the guardian figures and legends connected to the rivers. And his map of Rome traces the eternal city's features from the graffiti on its walls, um, very much a feature of Italy in these days. Um, and actually an example of people taking possession of their, when they feel dispossessed, taking possession of their streets by marking them. His map of Brexit, draws each country's cigarette packs. <laughs> Working a double pound on quitting. But the pages of his atlas, which bear most strongly on the theme tonight, the marriage and recreation of surroundings, also project fantastic visions. Shoreditch as New York. Um, this picture's clever transposition corresponds to those areas where quite now quite common in global cities, where the inhabitants reconfigure their streets as Chinatown or Little Italy, Italy or Koreatown or Little Tokyo. One way of dressing strange and alienating in a costume that's familiar. American style of multiculturalism has fostered the development of these districts, and the practice has spread for reasons closely associated with tourism and theme parks, but they don't always lead to harmonious relations. 
civil tensions in the original homelands can erupt in the streets of the host country. And these fights are not simulacra or adventures <coughs> in high reality, unfortunately. Adam Dant has also stepped into the world of purely imaginary maps, as found in Treasure Island or Peter Pan or Lily Roy Mandy. He is at present working on a series of myths. Oh, sorry, this is Soho by Day and Soho by Night. So here we, he has taken the exact idea of the star map, and instead of accepting the, the way that we name the map, the stars now, we've renamed them as Soho characters. Um, <laughs> uh, local stories about people there. So and this, which is a work in progress, is his, um, his the story of Jason and the Argonauts um, transposed into the London scene. And you'll see the British Museum, Nelson's Column, palaces and banks, churches and triumphal arches are all taking place in the hero's adventures. This new departure of Adams opens up another path, path to experiencing place, in a, inhabiting it as if it were a story we might already know, or a story we are discovering and making up. If we follow a different approach and reject easy acceptance of authenticity as an ideal and question the histori historicity of these acts of mapping, we can explore instead the potential of storytelling <coughs> as opposed to historical retrieval and reawakenings, valuable as these maneuvers can be in giving recognition and to addressing wrongs. So mapping can present a new story by superimposing uh, one event on another, as Adam has done here with Jason and the Argonauts on London. Some significant fig figure or event is translated to another place. Christian cult practices are founded on this principle, that the layout of a church reproduces Calvary, the high altar being Golgotha, while the ritual of the Mass enacts the death of Jesus on the cross. Round churches all over the world. So this is the church in Rome, which is a very familiar example of a Catholic device. It says Jerusalem in Rome. So it reproduces Jerusalem, has relics from, <coughs> relics from the crucifixion, and that turns the church into a piece of Jerusalem in Italy. Similarly, the, the first diagrams and maps of the temple in Jerusalem were, became the blueprint for new, in, innumerable versions of temples in, in the world. So it's a tiny one in Cambridge, the one church, and the big one in the city of London. And then in Abu Dhabi recently, I saw that the Dome of the Rock has been reproduced in miniature. Very, very well, very exact. I mean, beautiful tiles, very, but probably it's one to ten in scale. So, um, I'm just kind of, and then we saw about that. Okay, so this is the, um, I'm just going to get this, I'm sorry. I'll just quickly, because I'm not going to run out of time, so I'll just So theme parks are a huge worldwide phenomenon and um, attracting millions of visitors, yet they're generally ignored, tacitly scorned by the Academy and despised on the whole by someone like me, who I've been to Disneyland and, and to Alton Towers, and I actually really enjoy Alton Towers. But Disneyland and its kind are usually met with scorn, snickering. I have I want to go beyond the values that Disneyland promotes, beyond that charge of false consciousness and the aesthetic of cuteness and kitsch and the imperative of money making. These are all fundamental criticisms which I agree with. It sounds far fetched and absurd, but theme parks and reenactments have deep roots in ritual assembly, and they don't necessarily have to be adulterated by heavy commercial and national cultural interests. So basically, this, this is an imaginary map from, this is, this is two children who wrote this book. Uh, they were 14 and 15 at the time, and Arthur Ransom had it published. And they, they went on a pony adventure, in, in a, a pony holiday in Exmoor, and they imagined it as Persia. So you see, here they are in the cold sea of Devon, um, <laughs> bathing in the Aral Sea, and there they are building Persia on the map of the, um, and this is, this is an idea that I like very much, that you, you bend your experience through an imaginative frame. So that was, that was one of the ideas that um, we've been trying to apply in our, in our refugee um, work in, in Sicily. In so here, interestingly enough, this is one of the main meeting points of the many people living, the young people living there. And you'll see that they've actually created a map for the cafe. And 
it says, I mean, I tell I don't put you, my, my, my land, my territory, is where I put place my feet. But you also, of course, have to, in, in a way, have your dreams and your sense of who you are built on that sense of where you've you landed your foot. Um, and we decided that maybe exploring the city and developing stories for the city might be of interest, might, might build some kind of sense of connection. And uh, there is a genius, a genius loci in Palermo, called the genius of Palermo, which is an old man, an old king, with a fourth beard, who is apparently nursing a serpent. The story is conjectural, even though it's only 15th century, it seems to be lost, people have forgotten it. There are many, many uh, versions of this statue all over the town. He is the mascot, he is the Eros, if you did, if you like. Um, so we thought that that would make a kind of good destination for mapping and story making. So we went out with lots of these kid young people uh, with pencils and paper. And then th th these are several workshops, I'm just condensing them. And they, d they developed a story. And they made into a story scroll, you know, a story scroll, and into story maps um, of their own, which they were very pleased with. They weren't encouraged to look so happy with them they were. So this is, this, is, this, is one of the, this is one of the drawings they made of the, of the king. This is one of the performances um, of the story that they invented. And this is yesterday in um, Sicily. I was there yesterday yesterday morning, and that's another story scroll map. Um, so that's the, um, okay, so to conclude, uh, there's just a way of, um, um, a, a way of applying some of this, obviously when we first started doing it, I hadn't thought so much about maps. It was when it worked so well with these young people, they were so interested in actually discovering a place around them. Um, and recording it in a way that hadn't come through lessons, but was their immediate response to what they were seeing. But because it was successful, I then got very interested in what, how it is to, what it is to be unplaced, displaced, and replaced, and put, it, put back into, into, into an environment. So, uh, so to conclude, I can find my conclusion. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the story if you want, because it's a nice, very nice story there. Um, I don't think I can find it. Oh, it's fair enough. When it comes to story making, we have to keep trying. As Arendt declares in The Human Condition, stories are a form of action, a way we become historical, a way of inserting ourselves into the human world. It's a mistake to give up stories because fakes, news, threatens. We have to imagine sufficiently. And and we need to listen more to tell when someone is lying or someone is illuminating us with fables, parables, parables, anecdotes. Revisioning place in terms of stories provides a rich resource which has always been tapped, usually by the authorities, but not always. But the colonial exploitative and propaganda abuses should not vitiate the potential of narrative mapping in itself. Its potential it needs to be recognized and seized and harnessed for action. Thank you. to take a few questions. We've got time for just two or three, um, so, and there's a microphone going around at the back, so if you, um, yeah, yeah, um, short questions, please. Yeah, the, um, the map by the man Simon Patterson, which I've not seen before. Oh, really? Because it's quite just... No, yeah. no, I mean, I am sort of in a boy, sleep, boy way, a bit keen on maps, but I'm not coming across them. I, I noticed that I don't quite understand the intention of the map. It was a joke kind of thing. Yeah? No, I think it was a kind of idea of, no, it, was a, it, it, it kind of alerted us to the conventions of the naming system of the subway, of, the, of our metro system, um, and made, opened up potential, which of course the French do follow. They constantly do naming those streets. But we don't do that. 
and um, I think he no, I think he wanted to awaken us to alternative history. Yeah, but I also, think... even actually, even if he didn't intend that, I mean, what he intended might have been—I don't, I don't know what he intended. But, I, but, but how we received it, how it was received, and became very popular, was as a way of thinking about the city, thinking about our coordinates in time, as opposed to just coordinates in place. What what we are celebrating, what we are remembering. Yeah, well, on that point, I, I was quite struck by, by the fact that all the names are of people, with two possible exceptions, who were white. Yes, well, you see, it's 1990, people were not woke. Can I have a question over here? Yeah. I, I was just interested in the children in Palermo, or the young people. Did they bring their, did they bring elements of their home into their story about the moment? Like the interesting. So they're, 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 in a way, they're quite shy about that. With, with time, with a bit of time, we have two people here that have been working. The storyteller has been working with us, and with time, they do come forward with them. And, so, and in fact, the, the not the genuine story. That's the only Palermo uh, based story for that. The other stories that um, we've been working with um, were are mostly uh, from that they brought, with one in particular, um, which has got several interpolated stories in it, comes from Guinea. But actually the elements of the story are recognizable from many stories, the, um, about justice and, it's a, it's a, well, one example which we were, just this last week, working on in, animation, in an animation film is called The King's Favorite Bird, and it's interpolated in a story of someone being arrested and being unfalsely accused. So he tells his guards this story, and what happens in the story is that the, the king's favorite bird is growing, his plumage is growing dusty, and he's becoming, he can't sing anymore, his poor voice is hoarse, and so he goes into the forest to eat poisoned fruit because he feels he's useless. And um, he eats a fruit that actually rejuvenates him. So he comes back, very nice to do on animation, because he comes back all bright, and, and, um, and then um, the king says, my goodness, you're so changed. And he says, yes, I've eaten this fruit. And so the king says, give it to me to eat. But the king tests the fruit on a stone. And of course, the stone falls down dead. Whereupon the king strangles the bird and says, obviously, this bird wants to kill me. And of course, what's happened is, I mean, I'm sure there's you no know, fables. This is always a, po a snake has poisoned the fruit in the meantime. So the king has rushed to judgment and committed a violent act without, you know, courting or considering. That's very much the pattern of a lot of the stories they tell, which of course relates directly to what's happened to them in their lives. Or what happened to their parents in their lives. I mean, a lot of them are quite young, so. There's a question down here, so please. This is one of the storytellers, what I've found. And, and. What I've found, Can I just uh, give you a little anecdote about naming. Yes. Okay. Tarnowska, I'm married to a Tarnowski who is Polish. So we have this house in uh, East, former East Prussia, which used to be Germany. After the war, they gave a bit of Poland to Germany, and so we have the house there. And it's a very lovely, perfect illustration for your uh, lecture, Marina. So we live next to a little village called Krulikovo, which translated into Polish is rabbit's name. But the original German name is Kunisberg, which is Kingsville. Mm -hmm. But then somebody was trying to change all these names, but because they had to do it very, very, very quickly, got a little bit bored and translated the Kingsville into rabbitville because in Polish, Król is king and Królik is rabbit. Yes. So I just have to tell you that sometimes you, you end up having funny things when you're changing maps. And you pass the microphone back. Well, thank you very much for a really kind of tour of the full spirit, sort of whistle stop tour through history of cartography. Um, all right, uh, Karl Korzybski was a philosopher of science, and in science and sanity, that the quote comes from, what, he, what concerned him was that the maps that natural scientists were drawing of the world didn't at all correspond with the kind of mental maps that ordinary folk had. And he thought that was a real problem. How do you bridge that gap? And I think today we've got really two different cultures of cartography. We've got kind of digital cartography 
you know, cartograms, people using um, very sophisticated methods to visualize big data, all of that. And then we've got this explosion of, of, of work around uh, artists, artists and writers using maps, participatory mapping and so on. And, and uh, I mean, I, you know, we run an organization that tries to bridge that gap, but we're finding it very difficult. Most of you, we work with and how we work is actually with artists, working with children and young people yes. making real maps. Trying to get the, the, the more technical sort of people, the people into the sort of digital technology of mapping, engage in that in a very, very difficult problem. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about how that... What's your... Yeah. What's it called? Your... Living Maps, it's living maps, called. Yes. It? We're yes. doing a Young yes. Citizens Atlas of London, yes. so I really yes. want to talk to these people here. Yes, yes. For that, for that, for that moment. Just on this two cultures question. I think Anne Dunn is actually here, actually, obviously, the great leader of this material. But, um, yes, I was very, I mean, I think my first time became aware before I read, of course, it was absolutely great, which was another thing. I haven't read a version of what, but it was close to that thing. I saw on a fisherman's map, which was how you would see how for a fisherman's map for a fisherman of the coastline. And it was, of course, how you experience the coastline as a fisherman. It didn't look anything like that. But it was perfectly helpful. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, probably you know, invaluable. Um, if you wanted to avoid the currents or that. Or where the fish were. Yeah. 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 <laughs> One last question, this gentleman. Yes, yeah. Hello, hi, yeah. thank you, Rick. I just wanted to ask a question about the self-fulfilling prophecy of the fiction. I mean, you mentioned Verona yeah. and the King's Cross example. I just wondered if there's any others and whether people write fiction it will then actually become an actual place. But, but what I think, I mean, I have sort of thought for a very long time, really, because it sounds terribly immoral, but basically one of the things that has happened is that in the interest of truth and verification and veracity, a lot of things are set aside by as it were, people like us, um, because they're not true. Whereas, actually, the powers are doing that all the time. So I, I sort of felt that you know, storytelling is a method of resistance. One story against another, and they need to get hold of those narratives. They really do. And I think mapping is one of the ways of doing it. I mean, these, these, you know, these, um, these historical retrieval maps are fascinating. I mean, when you know, Emma Willard made her 1824 map of where the Native Americans had been, that's a revolutionary way of remembering. And, um, of course, it's not fiction. You know, right, in her case, it wasn't fiction. But I think fiction, well, what I tried to say about you know, the difficulty of the historical record, what George Saunders is saying, what he doesn't say in that quote, if those of you who have read Lincoln's body, is that the book that's about Lincoln's body um, is completely contradictory. With, all, with many of the other testimonies. So that Lincoln has blue eyes, he has brown eyes, he's six foot eight, he's six foot two, he's, you know, there's, there's sort of an incredible instability around someone who was the focus of intense observation. So Saunders takes that as kind of, I mean, I don't want to sound too postmodern, but as a, you know, as a kind of the ground of thinking how important the imaginative reconstruction is without worrying too much about the exact measurements of the Lincoln's height. Because that's always going to be kind of simple. I mean, perhaps not now with computers. But we we have to stop there course, because yes, that time is marching yes, on. Yes. But um, thank you so much, Marina, for a truly um, uh, fantastic lecture. My name is Anthony Bale, um, and I'm the, the Dean of the School of Arts. And it's my great pleasure to have been asked to give a kind of formal vote of thanks <laughs> after this, after this um, extraordinarily wide-ranging lecture. Um, I'm also in a very fortunate position, as several of you in the audience are here, of being able to count Professor Dave Marino Warner amongst um, my colleagues. And this evening's lecture has shown us just what a superb and um, incisive and wide-ranging thinker and critic and social commentator she is. Her lecture has also been, um, sadly, I suppose, um, incredibly timely, especially on a day when the news headlines have been dominated by the government's policies around closing borders, mm -hmm. and especially around the role of the English language, and the role of language about who can and cannot, or should and should not, belong. Mm -hmm. Professor Warner has vividly and eloquently um, 
uh, described the conjunction of territory and narrative, taking us all the way from this um, windowless lecture theatre in central London <laughs> to California, to Shanghai, to Jerusalem, but also to the places of dreams, of fantasies, of fairy tales, of religious belief, of graffiti, of the stars. Um, and here we are in London, um, at Birkbeck, in the centre of a global city. And um, this is also, as we know, a city of micro-communities and invisible borders, of streets that some of us never cross, of areas that some of us never go to. Each of us has our own London, and each of us has our own mental and emotional maps of London. One of the joys of working at Birkbeck is bringing the very diverse and um, diffuse communities of London together, of radically different groups of students and people working and thinking together. And Professor Warner's lecture, I think, has really nicely dovetailed with Birkbeck's mission of being an open place, a transformative place, both for individuals and communities, and a place, I'd like to think, for being able to rethink and remake the world. So I'd like, you now, I'd like to invite you now to join us for a drinks reception just outside the lecture theatre in the lobby area here. But before we leave the lecture theatre, can we um, please thank Professor Dame Marina Warner for an absolutely brilliant lecture.